Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Alicia, and I am excited to be joining you today to talk all about habitat. So it's my unicorn fish that just swam by. So you can see that we are uh, situated in our coral reef habitat. So we're going to be talking about habitats today and, and thinking about what that means, what they offer the animals that live there, the organisms that live there. Now, I would love your participation if you have questions, if you, if you have comments, things to share, uh, if you are answering some of the questions that I'm posing, then I would love your participation. You can text us at 562-286-1838. Uh, if, if, um, if you're texting from home, just make sure for our kids out there that you have permission from an adult. And just um, keep in mind that normal texting rates do apply. All right, so um, we'll keep the number up for just a moment here as we're exploring our very first habitat today. So again, this is our tropical reef habitat, and we have hundreds of animals in this 350,000 gallon exhibit. And this exhibit's quite large. Um, for those of you who have not had a chance to visit our aquarium, this is the big window that you would see gallery, but it extends all the way to this other side, and there are actually two other windows that you can view the animals here, so you'll see them kind of disappear and come back. And you'll probably notice uh, that the animals in here are, are pretty colorful, right? Well, what are some other things that you notice? If you want, you can even text those in. What are some of your observations, explorers? What are some things that you notice about the animals in here? Are there any animals that stand out to you or that you might have questions about? There are a lot of animals in a very small space, and this is very normal. So why does this home, this habitat, draw in so many animals? Well, if you're taking a look here, you, you'll probably notice that there are animals of lots of different colors and shapes and sizes, and basically they all have a relationship with this habitat. This habitat provides food, it provides shelter, this is a place for them to find their mates and have their babies. So safety and food, right, those are pretty important if you want to have a nice healthy life out there in your, in your habitat are really important for animals. And so having those resources really helps shape the entire habitat, or, or you can call it an ecosystem. When we say ecosystem, we're also including the living parts of an animal's home and the, the non-living parts of an animal's home, like the water. Now, if you were to visit this place in our planet, around our planet, you would have to go towards the middle of our planet, towards the equator. And the equator gets a lot of sunshine, makes it nice and warm. And so the animals here are used to a temperature that is nice and warm. So having the temperature that's warm, um, again, having these resources, and especially what's helping to build this whole ecosystem behind me. What is this stuff back here? Yeah, if you guessed it, this is the coral. This is what makes the whole reef. And coral is pretty incredible. Now that's what's really drawing these animals together. So we're gonna go ahead. Oh, thank you, Stacy. So I have a few friends here in our studio that are helping me out today. We have Stacy who is doing our controls. We have Amanda who's taking all of your questions and comments today. So um, if you're texting and you'll, you'll have a response from Amanda this afternoon. So behind me, this is a great, um, video of one of our live coral exhibits. Now the coral in our last exhibit was artificial, it's not real. And um, that is because we, we wanna make sure that we are being responsible um, and when we have these exhibits and taking that much coral out of a habitat um, would, would be very difficult. So having a smaller um, habitat like this to zoom into and um, the corals that we've grown here at the aqua aquarium responsibly uh, this is a very nice look at this coral habitat. Now, take a look at the coral. So again, these are animals. These are animals that are invertebrates. They don't have a spine. If you reach around and feel your back, we have this spine. Well, these animals, they are pretty squishy inside. <laughs> they don't have a spine. And to make sure they're not eaten by anything, they push out of their body this 
hard calcium carbonate. It's a, it's a material that gives them that hard rock-like structure. And they build their homes right on top of each other. And they're a group of animals, kind of like a big apartment complex. Now, if we were to zoom in and take a peek inside the coral, and what we have a camera that we'll take a peek at in just a moment, we would see an animal that looks very close to a sea anemone. And it's, a, it's called a polyp, and it has little tentacles on it. And so if we zoom into our camera, we have a special camera over here. I'll bring up some examples of this coral. And I'll turn our light down just a little bit to maybe help with our, our glare here. And I'm going to zoom in to see if we can get a, a closer look at the... Oh, that's beautiful. All right. So this is one type of coral. This is a plate coral, a type of plate coral. And there are a lot of these little um, dense... looks like a surface of an unknown planet to me, doesn't it? But this is... Uh, the skeleton, so this is the hard part that this animal pushes out of its body, grows, it grows very slowly, by the way, and it can defend itself. So when it feels threatened, it can kind of come in a little bit to its calcium uh, shell. So this is where the animal part would, would be. So that polyp is really incredible, and it can look a little bit different. So there are all these little holes and nooks and crannies for where those polyps can be, and they're a little bit of a, a different shape than some of the other coral that I have here. So I'm going to zoom back out a little bit and show you a type of branching coral. You can see the shape is a bit different, but still when we zoom in, it does have lots of little nooks and crannies for those coral polyps to live. Now some animals spend their whole lives in what we call a microhabitat. So if we were to zoom in, we would see little crabs and little worms, little tiny fish that would spend their life just around the coral. They wouldn't even swim out from the reef very far. They get protection from hiding around the coral itself. And so the, the coral polyp is really amazing. And there's um, algae that live sometime on top of the coral. So algae is another organism very similar to plants where it uses the sun to photosynthesize or make its own sugar using energy from the sun. And, you know, it's the same stuff really that grows in like pools that has to be cleaned. Yeah, there's different kinds of that algae out there in our oceans. And it settles on top of the coral. And there are little fish out there that have special mouths and they nibble on that algae. So it's a nice relationship because the coral needs to not be bogged down by that algae and the fish get to graze on the algae that kind of settles and grows on top of the coral. And so without the fish, there would be too much algae and without the, the coral, there wouldn't be anything for that algae to settle on. So kind of a nice relationship there. There's also, if we go back, uh, Stacy, to our photo, that zoom in, that was really great of the coral habitat that you were showing us. You might notice that there are different colors. And we get a lot of questions about colors here. You know, why is, a, why is a coral this nice, vibrant color? Well, it all has to do with a special symbiotic relationship, a balance between two animals, a relationship between two animals. And in this relationship, it's mutualistic, meaning that they both benefit. Now, there's another type of algae called zooxanthellae that actually lives inside the tissues of that coral polyp. Isn't that weird? It's cool, kind of crazy. So they, they merge into the tissues of that little coral polyp and the coral gives protection because of that hard shell to the algae. And the algae uses that sunlight to make sugars that photosynthesize and give some of that to the coral. So the coral actually gets a lot of its food from its, its little buddy, that, that algae. The algae also has different colors. So you can see all these different colors here. There's different relationships with different kinds of that zooxanthellae. So there's all kinds of interesting relationships in a coral reef. You may know of like the, the clownfish and the sea anemone. That's another type of symbiotic relationship. Here we go. So if you've heard of the clownfish before, 
and its little buddy. This is another kind of little habitat if we zoom into the reef. So in this relationship, our brightly colored clownfish are saying, hey, I'm going to defend my, my, my uh, anemone here. You know, stay away from my anemone. And it may actually even give it little pieces of food and feed its anemone. Here we go. Here's another type of anemone fish. And the anemone itself stings bigger animals. So you wouldn't want to give this animal a, a hug. In fact, when we're looking at this anemone, I had said that its cousin is coral. So zoomed in, it would actually kind of look like that in the coral, which is kind of crazy. We've got, we have some comments and some questions. Uh, Gage wants to know, uh, does the Pacific Bonito live in the kelp forest or open water? That is a great question, Gage. We're going to go into our... Um, kelp forest next, but I will tell you that it's more of an open water animal. But, you know, a lot of animals will, will stay in some of these areas as a nursery. Same thing with our coral reef. So there are some animals that are hatched or born in a kelp forest or a coral reef habitat. And then as soon as they get big enough, they will swim out into the, what we call an open water. And if we have time today, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about that habitat. Um, and then Trinity says, is that salt or fresh water? And yeah, we're looking, that's a great question because there are lots of water habitats and these are both salt water habitats. And so when we talked about an ecosystem having um, those non-living parts, we talked about the water, right? The water is really important. And in fact, our coral friends here behind me and all the fish rely on kind of the chemistry of the water um, being at ideal levels. So things like the salt in the water, we call that salinity, or the temperature, or the amount of acidity. All of those things, you know, are um, considered even when we recreate a natural habitat here at the aquarium. We have to consider kind of like those non-living things, the chemistry, right? And having good chemistry in the water for our animals makes them nice and healthy. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Those are great questions. Uh, Charlotte wants to know, what is the effect of the Great Barrier Reef becoming polluted? Oh, that's a great question, Charlotte. So we talked about that relationship with, um, so for one example, there is that balance, right, between some of those smaller fish eating the algae that can grow on top of the coral. Uh, and that's really important because Remember we said that the coral had algae, another kind of algae that lives inside that gives the coral food, keeps it healthy. So if things cover on top of the coral, like algae or even, um, let's say, dirt, if there's lots of soil that's coming down rivers and into the ocean because we've cut down a rainforest and that soil from the rainforest isn't settling down, it's washing down the watershed, washing down rivers, into the ocean, it can cover up um, a, a kelp or a, a coral reef habitat and not allow that algae to get enough that's inside the coral, that zooxanthellae, to get enough sunlight to make food for the coral. So I know it's probably not the pollutant you were thinking of, but runoff from uh, land, even things like we call sediment, so that soil can have an impact. There are other things, right? We talked about the chemistry of the ocean needing to be in balance. So pollutants coming down and disturbing the chemistry of the ocean can be a problem. They, they've even started to investigate how sunscreen, right? How sunscreen from snorkelers can even disrupt kind of the chemistry and the health of a coral reef. So thinking about, uh, you know, safe sunscreen for coral reefs is something to consider if we visit those places. Great questions. What type of coral do you have in your habitat? Uh, by Kenzie. Uh, so Kenzie, we have lots and lots of different kinds of coral. You know, I wish I was more of a coral expert to tell you the exact species, but I will tell you that we kind of classify them into, you know, two big groups, which are hard corals and soft corals. So these are hard corals. They have that really hard as we said, calcium carbonate on the sides. And then we have some of these soft corals that are a little bit more flexible to move 
in the water current, they also have usually bigger polyps that you can kind of see. Um, and they're, they have some hard parts in them, but uh, they generally are a little bit more flexible. And then in the hard corals, you have things like branching corals and plate corals. So we have in the back here some plate corals, which are, I think, aptly named. Uh, we can't see them in here, but and I think we might even have an example. Let's see. Oh, here's one of my favorites. You ready? We're going to go to my document camera. This is, ooh, nice zoomed in, but we're going to zoom back out. Ready for this? That is a tongue coral. Yay! I know, it probably doesn't look too much like a tongue, but I thought it was kind of funny. So this is a type of coral called a tongue coral. But that was a, a great question, uh, Kenzie. This is, <laughs> there are many, many, many different types. There are thousands of different types. There are even corals that li live in the deep sea, and they're thought to be some of the longest lived animals on the entire planet. Isn't that crazy? I think that's really cool. All right. So... We've talked a whole lot about what helps build this habitat. Um, and I have a few more questions before we, for the coral reef. So I wanna jump into these really quick. Um, so Kenzie asked, uh, do some coral glow? And yes, they do. They bioluminesce, which is really crazy. They have, or they, oh, they fluoresce. So they are able to um, use light waves to reflect light, which is really cool. Um, and again, we said that some of them live in the deep sea. And if you are deep sea, you have less of that partnership with the algae inside because the algae needs the sun and the deeper you go, it gets darker. So instead, they, they use their tentacles a little bit more to catch plankton. So we said that they had those polyps. And so attracting little plankton by being glowy glowy <laughs> can be very helpful. Isn't that, it? I just think it's fascinating when we just learn so many new things about uh, the deep sea that I think that are pretty incredible. And uh, Carter wants to know if coral can live out of the water. Yeah, unfortunately Carter, um, coral is a very sensitive animal. And so if it were to be broken off from the colony and brought up, it probably wouldn't survive very long. In fact, if you are ever visiting a coral reef habitat, they say even touching the coral can, can damage the coral because of those polyps, even, especially the soft coral. So the soft coral, is, although it's a little bit more flexible to move in the water, um, touching it can, uh, can endanger it. So yeah, those are great questions and um, some really great observations. All right, so we've just learned about what helps build this whole ecosystem. Now, just some last thoughts here. Do you see all these little nooks and crannies? These are wonderful places for some of these animals to hide. So we talked about some of the food relationships. Obviously, besides eating and grazing on the algae that settles on top of the corals um, for our our herbivores, as we call it, those veggie eaters, you also have carnivores in an ecosystem like this. So fish that eat other fish and you have those omnivores, right? So they might eat a little bit of that algae and a little bit of, you know, maybe like little snails or, or other animals that live in the coral reef. All right, we're going to transition. So I want you to keep in your head how that beautiful coral reef looked and I want you to compare it and make some observations to our kelp forest habitat. And we'll go ahead and bring up our webcam here. Whoa, what do you notice? Is it the same? Any differences? Yeah, you probably are noticing some of the colors, right? So first, let's take a look at some of those um, features at the bottom here. So, you know, in a coral reef, you will have some of the same like sandy areas at the bottom. But we're not seeing on our rocks here, we're not seeing any coral, right? So what are the animals hiding in? Well, a lot of the animals in here are going to be hiding in the rocks themselves. So they're going to be in these same color palettes as the, the animals that are in and around the rocks. And then this stuff here, what is this stuff? Yeah, this is, this is another, we're talking about algae again, but this is, this is a very big type of algae. So the, 
the algae that we see here is, are different types of seaweed. So we have, by the way, seaweed, kelp, algae, they're all talking about the same organism just in different ways. So we call this giant kelp and it's a type of algae. And it's, again, not a plant, but similar to a plant because it uses photosynthesis, but uh, it is designed a little bit different. So I had my kelp or seaweed model here. Now we usually use this in the classroom and we can stick it to our big carpet wall. So if you see some Velcro pieces <laughs> under here, it's because uh, we usually use this in a slightly different way. I, we've had a couple questions and for some of our other programs of what's that white stuff? Well, that's not part of our model here. We're kind of adapting it for our online learning today. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we're looking at what we call the blades of the kelp. And, you know, if we're thinking about an organism like algae that needs sunlight to grow, we have to have a surface for it to kind of attract that sunlight. And so these things are called blades. And the blades are wrinkly, and that helps water movement. Not only are they absorbing sunlight, but they're also absorbing nutrients from the water. They're getting... Um, again, that chemistry in the water is important. What's available for plants on land to grow? We think about the soil, getting some extra nutrients from the soil. Well, those nutrients are found for our aquatic friends in the water. And so having that available and having clean water is really important for all of the animals and um, especially our, our seaweed here. And so having kind of this bumpy texture makes sure that the water flows over and that the, the seaweed can soak up some of those nutrients. Then it has this middle part here called a stipe, and it's nice and strong, even in some of these strong water currents. And then it has something kind of fun. Right in the middle here, it has an air bladder. So if you think about it, you want to get as much sunlight as possible. You want to reach towards the surface of, there we go. Thanks, Stacy. You see these strong, flexible pieces because the waves are moving back and forth. You want to make sure that you can, you know, go with the flow. That's where the saying comes from, right? Go with the flow. And in order to float, they have those little circular bits right before the blade called an air bladder. And that air bladder kind of like floaties. Have you ever seen someone learning to swim and they put the floaties over their arms? Keeps your arms up, same thing. They have little floaties all the way up. Now, this helps them too if they ever are detached from a rock because they hold themselves down with something called a hold fast. If that ever becomes uh, ripped off, let's say there's a big storm, that seaweed will float to the surface and as long as the, the water conditions are still okay, it can still be fine just drifting around. Sometimes that's why we get them on beaches. And if the tide's able to pull that seaweed or that kelp back into the ocean, it's gonna be fine. Sometimes though, it gets trapped on a beach. I don't know if you've ever walked on the beach and smelt the seaweed as it starts to rot, it's pretty bad. Some of that's because uh, seaweed is actually covered in a layer of slime. Kind of fun, kind of gross. <laughs> Sometimes when we feed our animals seaweed, uh, we have to like squeegee off that slime that gets on it. We have to go and it looks like you just blew your nose into your hand. It's gross. But what does that do? Well, it does offer a little bit of protection. So let's say that the um, kelp is exposed to air, maybe at the surface, there's a lot of it bunched up it won't dry out, or if it does get washed onto a beach, that layer helps it from being dried out until the tide can move it back into the ocean. Sometimes it doesn't work out for it, and I think, I think that's probably why it smells a little worse when it starts to rot. But if it can hold on to the tide comes back out, it will survive out in the ocean for a little bit. And believe it or not, if you're on a a whale watch, we sometimes look for kelp floating because it often means there's going to be animals hiding in the kelp. It's kind of a fun place to look for sharks and other animals that are um, kind of hunting around the kelp that's floating, especially after a storm or little fish. So I've, I have seen some of this out there on our, our whale watches. It's pretty cool. All right, so we were looking at this kelp. Now let's go maybe back to our webcam and take a peek at some of the animals that live in this habitat.
All right, so again, this is what's really building this whole ecosystem here. Look, we have our sardine school, yay. So there's, you know, in a sardine school, we talk about a school of fish, there are hundreds to thousands of these animals. And because they're not hiding behind any of the kelp here, they will cluster very tightly together. So there's different, different ways to kind of hide in, in these areas. Or you can be like the Garibaldi who's like, look at me, look at me, don't bother me. <laughs> it's using its colors a little bit differently. All right, so we're, we're taking a close look. This is another view. This is a great view here. And you can see that um, in some of these shallow areas, especially as we move from California up to Alaska, um, especially in our tide pools, it gets really colorful. So some of the animals here can actually be these nice bright colors. Yay, look, there's a, a leopard shark swimming by. So we've just compared these two habitats. What are some of the differences? Did you notice anything in particular? Feel free to text in. We have a few more moments. I think there's a couple more questions coming in. I did want to, and I said I was going to try this, uh, this class, to talk about one more ecosystem that we don't always get a chance to talk about. Now, if we were to move away from these shallower, shallower areas that rely on sunlight and go into the slightly deeper parts of the ocean, we call this the open ocean. And in these open ocean habitats, we have slightly bigger animals. And so these animals can, uh, that, that we were just talking about, can hide in and around things. But what about the animals that live in these open spaces that don't have any places to hide? Well like our white shark. Now the white sharks will visit uh, shallow areas, especially to find food, but there are uh, a lot of the year they will migrate. In fact, there was an, a really cool white shark cafe expedition that just happened where a bunch of researchers tagged, they add these um, satellite tag, kind of like a, an earring that they place in the cartilage part right up here, and it allows them to track the shark and see where they go. And they, they're finding that they were heading all the way out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And they think that there might be some sort of interesting food out there for them to eat or a place to kind of meet up and find their mates. So it was a really interesting study. They're still going through all that information they collected. But um, this is an example of an open ocean animal, an animal that not only lives out there, but they also migrate quite a um, quite a distance. Uh, let's take a look at a couple other examples of some of these ocean, open ocean animals, maybe our mola mola. Yay, our pancake fish. <laughs> this is, um, so if you want to make like your, your mola mola. Um, so our, our mola mola here, also known as the ocean sunfish, is pretty cool. These animals are very different looking and they can be very large. They can, in fact, they are the largest bony fish. They can get up to 5,000 pounds. And from the very tip of one fin here to the very top, they've measured a 16 foot mola mola, which is huge. That is a huge animal. And this animal eats mostly gelatinous animals <laughs> like tunicates, which are kind of these globular, see-through animals, and jellies. I think that's crazy. Like this. Can you imagine? This animal gets to be 5,000 pounds. Now, not all of them. Those are just like the huge versions of this animal. But, and they mostly eat things like, yeah, like these moon jellies. I, I think that's absolutely incredible. And so they have these little mouths that just kind of like this little old is suck in they're, they're jellies and tunicates. They're not really chasing anything down. <laughs> they're not fast enough for that. Uh, and then they have this kind of paddle-like uh, fin on the back. So again, this animal wouldn't do very well, right, in a kelp forest. It wouldn't do well in a coral reef. It's navigating where it's just chasing down, again, these kind of soft-bodied animals. And it uses its side, size as defense. It also doesn't have scales like other fish. It has these plate-like um, coverings around its body. So it's hard to bite into if you were a predator. All right, so Natalie asks, if coral can't be out of the ocean, how do you get it out of the ocean? 
Well, that's a really good question. So if, um, let's say a researcher, we do have a coral, there are a couple places around the, the world that are breeding coral. They're trying to raise coral in labs and hopefully, um, you know, repopulate coral reefs, get their numbers up a little bit. And so they are able, here's a great example. So this is a coral piece that's in a lab and we're breeding the coral. We're hoping that, see the little eggs? These are eggs that are being released and um, we're hoping to populate. So that's a great question. How do you get it out if it won't survive? Well, you have to scuba dive and they scoop up the the coral and they put it in a container that has the water so that you don't ever have to take it out of water. And then you would be putting it back into a container in a lab. And again, they have to be very um, responsible about this. So this is something that's not just happening by anyone. These are scientists that study coral and they have the best intentions for, for helping out the coral reef. And if a coral isn't feeling healthy, it's not going to be very good about having its baby. So they have to be extra sensitive to the coral that they're raising. Um, so we, we don't have a huge live coral, uh, you know, collection here at the aquarium. Most of the coral that we have is artificial and the and animals don't mind, but we are able to, um, to grow a lot of our own coral here. And uh, Natalie also asked, do we have any sharks? Yes, I think we can put up our shark cam. So sharks, reef sharks uh, get their name. We're going to go ahead and show you a, a few of those reef sharks, Natalie. They're perfect for maneuvering in a coral habitat. Some of them, even like white tip reef sharks, will take little naps <laughs> in tunnels and hang out during the day and come out at night. But our, our larger reef sharks here, uh, they are a perfect size for kind of navigating in these little bends and dips in a coral habitat. Some of the sharks, though, are a little bit bigger, and like a uh, like a tiger shark. They'll sometimes visit coral reefs. If it gets really shallow, though, they're going to be hunting along the outside of the coral reef. Or like a white shark, again, is going to be a little bit more of that open ocean animal. They're not going to hang too close because the the reef itself can be really sharp. You wouldn't want waves to push you into that if you're a big animal. Kenzie asks, can you eat algae? Yes, algae tastes good, <laughs> uh, personal opinion. <laughs> but uh, there are lots of algae that's being harvested. So we can actually have an algae farm so people can farm algae. And it's different than the giant kelp pieces that we were looking at. But there are different uh, species of algae that's farmed. Uh, Nana wants to know if there are edible kelp and then kombu is an edible kelp eaten in East Asia. Thank you, Amanda. So Amanda's putting out some fun facts for me to, to do, to, uh, to be able to share with you. Um, so yes, there are lots of algae. Um, I know I especially like to, to snack on some dried algae. And I think she's finishing up some questions here. Oh, okay, do white sharks, so the great white shark, have pupils? Um, so yes, they have circular pupils that are hard to see. So thank you, Kenzie, for that question. Maybe we can go back to the... So it's kind of hard to see in there. So a pupil helps a direct light. Now we need light in order to see pictures around us. And the pupil allows us to um, take in different amounts of light. So if you see an animal that doesn't have or doesn't have a pupil, it might just be taking in kind of the same amount of light but having a pupil allows us to contract, to take in less light or expand to take in more. So Amanda says, yes, it's hard to see here, but they can regulate the amount of light that they take into their bodies, which I think is so cool. <laughs> All right, well, we've talked about coral reefs, we've talked about kelp forests, and we've talked just a little bit about the open ocean. I hope it was enough to get you interested, to tell you that there are so many different types of habitats, both big habitats and even tiny, what we call micro habitats to investigate. So if anything, I hope you have lots of questions that you keep exploring, and I do appreciate all the participation and questions. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us uh, for our online academy here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Take care.